Hello everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Vanakkam, assalamu alaikum and I bow one. Welcome to this, the sixth topic in our series of MCM Sri Lanka Knowledge Hub webinars created and curated especially for you to bring you information, insights, analysis and in-depth knowledge on topics that are really relevant, important and immediately impactful to you. We hope you have been following our series and that the topics that we focus on as well as the insights from our eminent panels on these subjects help you in your planning towards business continuity and repurposing in the medium and long term. And in case you have missed any of our previous sessions, they are available via our YouTube channel and Chan Sri Lanka where I urge you to watch, like, share them and of course give us some love by subscribing. Now today as we move into our third week of return to normalcy and start accelerating our efforts at kickstarting our businesses and our economy we do so not in the aftermath of a pandemic but rather in the midst of it sri lanka over the past two days consecutively reported its highest numbers of covid infected patients and although dr anthony fauci did make a statement that an effective vaccine could be available by the end of the year the general consensus in the medical medical community is that it will be well into anything between 18 to 24 months before either an effective vaccine is available or we reach a stage of herd immunity so the current buzzword in boardrooms across the globe sustainability sustainable restart sustainable recovery and sustainable growth despite and in spite of the challenges and restrictions that covid will enforce on us how do we achieve sustainable recovery Now the fundamentally pivotal role that banks and financial institutions play in recovery is well unarguable. Uh, in fact a couple of weeks ago his excellency the president Gotabaya Rajapaksa in fact called on the banking sector to think outside the box, innovate and adapt their services and products for just this reason. So yes we all know the fundamentally key role that banks and FIs play but just how much do we understand this? And if we do what is it that we understand? or think we understand 70 plus days of super paced learning adapting and innovating on the go yes we've learned so so much more than we knew or understood those 70 plus days ago but today here at amcham we thought maybe we'd give the experts the opportunity to enlighten us hopefully in simple lay terms so we all take away a better and more accurate understanding of what does can and will provide us with a sustainable recovery and growth trajectory so on our panel today we have professor ranjit bandara he is the chair and head of the school at the colombo school of business management he also serves as a senior professor in economics at the department of economics university of colombo professor bandara is a professional trainer and master facilitator who with a broad experience in leadership strategic management coaching and mentoring He has worked for many years in the field of leadership and management as well as self development. He was instrumental in transforming the Sri Lanka Foundation as the leading national center for leadership education and training and has worked with many national and international organizations as a trainer, a consultant and an expert. He is a winner of the Humphrey Fellowship, a prestigious fellowship only awarded to two Sri Lankans so far, winner of the Swedish International Development Scholarship, Norad Fellowship and the Commonwealth and Australian Research Scholarships. He was a member of the National Economic Council of Sri Lanka and the Financial System Stability Consultative and Rating Committees of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Professor Bandara Bandara was also the chairman of the Sri Lanka Foundation and senior economic advisor of the Strategic Enterprise Management Agency which comes under the office of the president. He has also served as a senior director on numerous boards of directors of both public and private institutions. Professor Bandara or Prof as we uh, endearingly call him Uh, earned his bachelor's honors degree in economics from the University of Peradeniya in 1990 and subsequently completed two master's degrees an MA in economics from the University of Colombo in 1992 and an MSc in management of natural resources and sustainable agriculture from the Agriculture University of Norway in 1995 he earned his PhD in economics from the University of Queensland Australia in 2000 <coughs> Uh, Prof has contributed to number of national and international journals and is the author of many books written on the various themes in economics and related subjects and has also served as the editor of the Sri Lanka Economic Journal. He is the founder coordinator of two postgraduate degree programs, the Masters in, in Economics and the Masters in Business Studies at the University of Colombo and is also currently the editor of the Management Digest, a premier management journal in Sri Lanka and the Journal of Entrepreneurship of CSBM. 
Uh, next, we have Mr. Dimanta Seniviratna. Mr. Dimanta Seniviratna is the Group Chief Executive of the National Development Bank, PLC, and counts 30 years in the banking industry. Prior to joining the bank, he was the Director Chief Executive Office of Pan Asia Banking Corporation. And prior to that, he spent 15 years with the HSBC Group, where he held key senior management positions, including Chief Risk Officer Post of Sri Lanka and Maldives, Bangladesh, and Thailand, where he was also responsible for business growth, strategy, and governance in those respective geographies as a member of the country leadership team. Mr. Seniviratna commenced his banking career with Sampath Bank and has also served in Overseas Trust Bank, Colombo Branch, and Saudi British Bank prior to joining HSBC. Mr. Seniviratna holds an MBA from the Postgraduate Institute of Management, University of Chichaiwadanapura, and a bachelor's from the same university. He's a senior fellow member of the Institute of Bankers, Sri Lanka, and a postgraduate diploma holder in computer system design from the NIBM. He successfully completed the High Potential Leadership Program at Harvard Business School, Boston, in 2016. He's a past president of the Association of Professional Bankers, Sri Lanka, having held various positions in the Executive Council of the APB for over a decade. And he currently functions as the chairman of the Sri Lanka Banks Association Guarantee Limited. Uh, next, we have Ms. Ranjani Joseph, partner, head of banking services at Markets and Markets at KPMG Sri Lanka. Ranjani mm -hmm. has over 20 years of professional service experience across sectors and functions as lead audit partner for the large group of companies and has extensive experience in carrying out audits for banking and financial service entities in Sri Lanka, including carrying out audits for local branch officers of the international banking ent entities in Sri Lanka. Uh, next, Ravi Shankar Vikneswaran is the Chief Financial Officer of Fairfest Insurance, a highly motivated and ambitious management professional with analytical capabilities, <coughs> offering years of progressive experience across a broad range of financial and accounting functions, from planning and budgeting to compliance reporting, audit, and an ability to combine vision with a well-developed project management and leadership skills to support and position for sustained growth, which is all we're talking about today. Your moderator for this evening's session, in reality needs no introduction. Nista Kasim is the founding editor of the Daily FT, Sri Lanka's first and only national daily business paper since 2009. He's a highly respected senior journalist and editor with over 25 years of experience, with his byline appearing in many frontline news publications in Sri Lanka over the years. He has traveled widely for training in journalism and marketing, as well as reporting of global and regional business and economic events for Sri Lankan leadership. And he's also a member of the Editors Guild of Sri Lanka. I'm Rai Raymond, General Manager, Executive Director of the American Chamber of Commerce in Sri Lanka, creator and facilitator of this series of webinars. Nista, over to you to guide us in this enlightening journey. Thank you very much, Rai. <clears throat> uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm privileged to moderate a panel of such eminence. So <clears throat> we'll try to make best use of this uh, uh, from the expertise. I also like the webinar participants to make it interactive so we will get the best out of all these experts. <clears throat> uh, what we will do is uh, kind of deep dive in terms of how can the financing of the post-COVID recovery uh, can be sustained, um, can be made more meaningful, more inclusive. And uh, we have um, the best experts to share the insights. And we will also look at from a customer perspective and also look at what some of the, what are the challenges of the banking industry in terms of post-COVID recovery. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Ravi uh, in terms of how, what do you think are the basics, uh, basic in monetary and fiscal support for businesses uh, in this post-COVID recovery? Uh, hi, thank you, Nista, for the question. Uh, um, hello, everyone. Uh, to start off with, uh, this economy uh, is a standstill at the at the moment uh, with this COVID pandemic being uh, struck for the past two three months. Having said that, the government actually has supported uh, in terms of the monetary uh, measures as well as on fiscal uh, fiscal policy measures. Uh, there has been some rate cuts in order to uh, support the lending rates. Uh, the government, the CBSL, has reduced the statutory reserve requirement uh, to enhance the money supply. On the fiscal point of view, the main um, uh, the main attractive point is that the government actually has given 50 billion um, uh, the moratorium for the for, for, I mean for the, for the companies who are actually suffering. So, the moratorium also includes uh, uh, permanent overdraft and trade uh, 
finance facilities uh, pawning facilities have been ex- extended so there have been deadlines which have been extended there have been i've seen some working capital loans which have been given uh, apart from that uh, the other additional factors such as deployment of this uh, 5000 rupees allowance during the months of april and may is uh, is yet to be is, is well received uh, Uh, by the public, even though there have been some complaints that the public haven't received the money, but still, I, I suppose that is a very good initiative. And um, um, uh, there have been twenty thousand uh, grant or for the for the graduates, uh, especially uh, to support their employment income. Uh, there have been food cards uh, issuance uh, for the low income earners. Uh, so overall, uh, all in all, what I feel feel is the government is actually supporting in terms of uh, enhancing the fiscal policy as well as on the monetary measures uh, to support um, uh, the community and to and to and to and to sustain the economic growth. Yeah, that's what <coughs> I feel, uh, Mr. Okay, Ravi, is is from I know it's an early question. Is it adequate? I mean, uh, are you kind of from a from a Someone from outside the industry is it adequate? There are lots of questions about whether it's effective and adequate. Well, um, we should be thankful for the 50 billion grant that we have we have received uh, yet. Um, uh, to start off with, uh, the there there have been certain ambiguity in terms of the market whether the the, the grant is actually adequate or not. But uh, to start off with, I, I suppose all the banks are actually um, are trying to uh, provide the 50 billion had been allocated amongst different banks to provide the grant to the. low income as well as on the suffered industry so um, rather than saying it's being inadequate i think the government or the banks are trying hard to complete the first phase of uh, providing this 50 billion and then probably they would uh, think of moving back to the second phase in terms in case if there is any additional uh, requirement which comes okay fine thank you <clears throat> i think we have in the panel dimanta so who when we, we come to dimanta he can explain the status quo but i'll move on to Ra- uh, ranjani in some of uh, i like you to give a perspective from where are the banks coming from uh, for this covid situation i know you did a report recently uh, tracing the performance and the trends of the industry so i like you to share some background and maybe talk a little bit more on the real status quo of the banks themselves Sure, Nisha. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and I would like to first thank uh, Ryan and Chen for giving me the opportunity to be part of this eminent panel. Nisha, to your answer your question, uh, basically our report, what we have done is we looked at the 2019 performance of the banking sector. As all of us know, banking sector is the backbone of any economy. Um, our, ba- our uh, banking sector is represented by around 26 uh, licensed commercial banks and seven uh, specialized banks. and the systematically important banks being bank of ceylon peoples bank combank and uh, hnb account for 54% of the industry assets while the two state banks anyway represent around 34% uh, if we look at the total assets of the banking sector uh, it's around 12522 billion and 63% of it is represented by the net loans so in our report what we have done is we looked at uh, 2019 performance Uh, looking at how the loan portfolios have moved, and as we all know, the banks have adopted the expected loss models. So, therefore, how the performance of the provision covers, um, also the uh, deposit composition, and how the net interest margins have moved, uh, the liquidity positions. So, just to look at the loan portfolios, we found the term loans uh, represented the significant segment of the loan portfolios. um and on the deposit side we saw a significant increase in the fixed deposits so if you see uh, fixed deposits the interest expense is high so the cost is high so when the interest income is coming down the interest expense was going up so we saw the net interest margin showing a decline last year um having said that we also know how the easter attack affected uh, in april the sme sector and the tourism sector in particular Uh, the banks had to face the moratoriums granted for those two sectors also however in the third and the fourth quarter we saw recoveries and the banks were getting ready to get the benefit of the um, tax uh, benefits announced as well however in 2020 uh, they have back to facing a new challenge uh, another thing we have actually looked at in our report is the new trends which we see coming out um, especially with the more acceleration after the covid incident uh, digital transformation was always on the on cards however we saw a significant increase in that and even the customers who were looking for visiting physical branches uh, decided to move into online 
Uh, in fact, uh, I think Microsoft made a comment to say the digital transformation they saw in the last two months is much more than what they saw, what they were expected in two years to come. Um, so that actually is a very positive sign. The digital migrants are being very positive. So that will enable the banks to move towards what we all wanted on the digital transformation and the banks were already uh, in progress. Um, having said that, the non-performing loans, especially after the COVID incident, uh, although uh, we know the moratorium, Ravi has already touched on the, some of the announcements, central banks did relax some of the regulatory requirements. Uh, the capital requirements they have given, uh, minimum capital requirements have been uh, deferred to 2022. And there are um, some relaxations given in the liquid cover ratios and so on. This will enable banks to uh, look after some of their day-to-day -day, uh, liquidity positions as well as the moratorium requirements. Having said that, we also anticipate uh, banks definitely are going to face a uh, crunch on the liquidity position, uh, mainly because the interest income is not going to come while they have to service the interest expense and there may be drawdowns on the deposits as well. So we see the focus of banks moving from profitability more towards liquidity in this quarter. We have already seen the first quarter numbers. Of course, we have not seen the real impact of COVID-19 results because some of those impairments have not come in yet and the loans have not been processed. The other one, of course, with uh, digital comes the other related risk, the cyber risk uh, and people working from home. Some of the internal control processes may have been relaxed. So that can pose new risk to the banks. So we have actually looked, analyzed some of those trends also in our report. Uh, thanks, Ranjani. I mean, um, what what would be your biggest concern? Uh, I mean, you said liquidity, but uh, uh, the NPLs weren't so great and it was getting worse uh, even before COVID. Yeah. Um, going forward, uh, when the six, uh, six first half numbers are out, you might have a better assessment. Uh, what would you flag off as like what to watch out for? Um, the, the current thinking is that the moratorium flexibility should not be considered as deterioration in credit risk. So therefore, the NPA classifications have not happened. As you rightly said, after six months, we need to see how many of these borrowers are really going to recover from the moratorium facilities or some of them really will start deteriorating and that's when the banks will have to start looking at the NPA. So third quarter, in my view, will be a better indicator because second quarter, by the time the loans are all processed, you still have time, third quarter and then the fourth quarter. Um, mm. You have already noted the most of the Western banks who have reported their first quarter numbers and second quarter numbers, Australian banks, the impairment charges have gone up between 20 to 30 percent, and which is more realistic, I would think. Okay, fine. <clears throat> uh, excellent so far. I like to, I think, uh, ideal platform for the to, for Dimanta to come. Uh, Dimanta, um, there is a lot of uh, debate within the industry and outside, also, then a lot of um, sort of concerns about lack of support. Uh, the speed with which banks have been responding the issues. So I like you to sort of maybe take longer time to explain uh, what's the real status, and also first start off with clarifying: is it only 50 billion? It's a credit, uh, 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 it's a <clears throat> credit uh, guarantee scheme, uh, and whether you can scale it up. What would be the actual support coming from the banking sector? Okay, uh, thank you, Nista, for that question. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, American Chamber and also Rai for inviting me for this uh, webinar. Uh, yes, I think the impact and how the banks reacted to that, I would say is uh, in a very strong manner, banks came in to support in the, especially in the first few weeks of the uh, COVID impact when we had to close down our operations and then uh, to assist the customers uh, banks went out of the way kept certain branches open despite taking numerous risks to our own staff to support the immediate need of helping the transactions being supported so that's where uh, the central bank the banking sector the uh, lanka clear system all work together to ensure that the payment platform remains same and then we went out of the way to 
go and deliver cash mobile ATMs some of us we didn't have mobile vehicles and also we got uh, ATMs installed into that and supported that so I think that was the initial reaction to that uh, thereafter as Rajini mentioned uh, the liquidity was the other uh, main concern and right, quite rightly when uh, customers are unable to pay and there's a monitorium also supported by the central bank on that side you need to pay the interest and the bank's primary responsibility is safeguarding the depositors money, money and also ensuring that the payment system works so so there again uh, central bank also came up with various measures to ease out the liquidity so the statutory reserve requirement was reduced some of the government uh, debt also was allowed to be classified for the liquidity ratios the uh, lcr ratio was also brought down to 90 so there were regulatory supported liquidity measures to improve to meet this current situation and then the banks Man, and finance companies are yeah. Man, just before you go on I, can you just stop pause and tell me how much of liquidity support what do you mean in rupees and cents how much was was ex extended so uh, the, 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 the statutory liquidity ratio was brought down by about one percent so that itself released a quite a sizable liquidity to the market you uh, have a figure for that figure uh, uh, so if you look at the total banking sector deposits so roughly uh, it's about I think uh, Rajini mentioned the figure uh, I would assume it's about 10 trillion roughly so in such a situation a one percent of that is about 100 billion coming into the market mm -hmm. uh, uh, so so that's only one side and then the uh, uh, allowed certain receivables from the central bank also considered for the liquidity calculation uh, the rate reductions were also made and uh, then the capital buffers also was reduced so yeah. knowing that there will be an impact on the NPL side so those were adjusted so that the banks can meet this situation is Apart this, from that, the finance companies also were allowed to relax their uh, liquidity, uh, the definition of the liquidity, where they are supposed to keep in certain liquid funds, those were also reduced uh, from 10% to 5% kind of, so that there's another liquidity that was released to support this. And, uh, and then these finance companies and banks also are interlinked so that to ensure that banks won't pull out the funding lines given to finance company because otherwise it will create a huge systemic risk. <clears throat> so to avoid that, there's a lot, lot of discussions happening. And central bank also requested banks also support this. So I think we are here to support each other. Because I think as Rajini mentioned, <clears throat> much of the issue initially is would be with the finance companies where because their deposit interests are mostly the monthly interest payment. Whereas the banks FDs are either six months or one year whereas the finance company most of the high interest pay uh, receive, uh, receiving investors like the pensioners and all they derive they basically their living is based on the interest income so they have done the monthly interest kind of a deposit mm -hmm. so those would be the first to get impacted when the debt payments are not coming in okay so uh, banks also have the responsibility to uh, support these institutions when they have a uh, unutilized lines or the earlier book lines so that 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 is happening as an industry to help each other so yeah, no is a demand is there was a figure i mean uh, mentioned about 300 billion of liquidity is available i mean it was the new liquidity made available right? is that yeah. correct or is that or is it between 300 to 400 billion rupees i think the 300 billion figure is right nista because it's a central bank's holding of its uh, bills so I'm sure in a situation like this, the government has to come and pay print money and put that because that is important in a situation like this. And later, the, when the economy picks up, you mop it up that excess liquidity through the long term bonds. So that is the tool that is used any central bank in a situation mm -hmm. like this. So I think it's uh, that's the amount uh, that is available, which was immediately pumped into the system. Apart from that, if you look at today's liquidity position, the today but it's about 100 billion liquidity is available in the money market so the liquidity levels are quite good at the moment so i think we have come through that initial worry situation because uh, i did now we have come out this covid situation hopefully we won't hope that it would be a w kind of a uh, 
strike at we had to ensure government so far has managed the uh, health situation quite well they will ensure that that's it's up to the government also ensure that this won't get uh, there's a spike i mean that is the main thing uh, apart from that how you manage the economy so i think now we see a lot of efforts being made to ensure that the economic revival is made so in that light uh, nista getting back to the earlier question of the 50 billion uh, saubhagya loan scheme uh, now that was what is announced that central bank is pumping in as a refinance scheme so banks have to evaluate the credit risk of the existing customers and each customer can take this facility only from one institution they can't go to another bank and so when you register you get a unique identification and then uh, so that way the central bank also ensure that one particular customer takes this amount only from one institution and each bank and finance company have allocated a certain figure so one question is whether this 50 billion is enough or not that is a question that we i don't think that is enough my personal view is when you look at a 10 trillion 10 trillion rupee uh, lending book banks have 9 trillion finance companies about 1 trillion so altogether 10 trillion loan book 50 billion is just 0.5% of that so may not be enough hopefully this should get addressed because this 50 billion also is allocated among the banks based on the portfolio sizes and we have been sending our applications so i know there are concerns that as a delay as well the customers are naturally complaining that it has not come but one need to understand also there's a long process as well because first of all we need to give it to the existing customers and we need to prioritize because these loans are capped at 25 million per customer for the time being to ensure a broader number of customers would get the benefit and also the central bank also wanted the banks to consider those who have a larger employee base uh, so to protect because ultimately this contribution coming from the government should be also allocated to ensure that our employment levels are kept and there are certain conditions also which is one is that those customers also given undertaking that the employees will remain in their payroll Uh, so we need to get the employ numbers mm. and process it and then send it to the central bank and central bank has to go through their waiting process and register then only the funds are released so and then what happened was in the last one one to two weeks there was a quite a high number of uh, applications came from all the banks so there was a bottleneck with central bank processing level as well because all the banks have started processing because we also should be in mind after covid we opened up uh, for operations only last monday so then only the real activity started and then the central bank also to process it but hopefully so central bank also in, uh, extended the deadline and now in our case i know i can talk about my bank we have already released part of these funds to the customer though we have not been reimbursed by the central bank bank pay that cost and we have already released it so how it works is that uh, yes at 4% the customer would get the funding uh, central bank will refinance us with 1% so actually the uh, so when when you get it our cost of funds is 1 and then we get at 4% however the banks are supposed to carry the credit risk throughout this tenor of this uh, exposure so that is the other thing that since the banks have to carry the credit risk we naturally have to evaluate and give to the right customer so that evaluation process is the other one that has taken time and now in our case we have already evaluated and we have got the approval tomorrow is the deadline for us to submit our within to center bank we have already submitted our applications to the center bank so i'm sure the other banks also may be something similar so by next week onward most of these would get dispersed uh, so that is about the uh, saubhagya loan scheme nista i will touch <coughs> on the others later on Maybe yeah so yeah, to clarify just for two months of working capital uh, 25 million maximum and this is largely to pay the salaries largely to pay the salary because the working capital say some importer right since the import is also restricted i don't think there's enough requirement to fund the stocks and all mm-hmm. but mainly to pay the salaries and ensure these companies manage this couple of months and some companies are also curtail their salary bills as well to manage the situation so it's mostly to cover the uh, salary and the other fixed overhead elements okay. uh, for two months uh, but in some cases it's more than two months but we'll ensure that 
uh, ma- maximum number of customers would get the benefit so that is why i think say regulator also introduce a cap of 25 million but in our case average size of this loan can be about 5 to 10 million in the mm-hmm. sme side but in the corporate banking side roughly around 20 25 million uh, that is how we have allocated to bo uh, we need when you allocate that our allocation also to ensure that all our customers also would get a benefit rather than all given to one particular segment otherwise few corporates would basically take the entire lot so we have to ensure that it is equitably distributed among okay. both sectors uh, just two two things to clarify are you asking for collateral or in a business plan for the, to release these funds no uh, nista i think collateral is secondary because most of these clients are own existing clients and we know the history we know their turnover levels and also uh, most of the cases i think we have not asked for any collateral maybe additional corporate guarantee or in as the mortgage value if that is available otherwise we go by the cash flows and allowed but some customers there may be credit issues so this those we need to ask for some collateral but we may not wait for the completion of the collateral we know that there are delay in legal process and all so as far as the undertaking is there we can release but i think i would say 90% of these exposures are without any additional collateral only a documentation like a letter of offer acceptance of letter a letter of offer and then release the funding so and no business plan required huh? for these there you can't ask for a business plan because these are working capital Okay, fine. I'll come to three hundred million facility that earlier uh, came up. I mean that for that, of course, we need to have a business plan. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thanks. So, thank you very much, Adimanta. Uh, move on to uh, Professor uh, Ranjit Bandara. Uh, I'm sure you are keen on the the speed in which the support is extended. So, I'd like to sort of bring you into the discussion. So, what kind of an impact are we talking about uh, post COVID? And uh, are you satisfied at the speed in which? Relief has gone in or not gone in so far, Professor. You need to unmute. Thank you, uh, Nisha. Um, you see uh, the the impact uh, of the COVID is just to assist uh, globally, regionally, and locally. Uh, no one have uh, come out with the real impact in my opinion uh, this may be uh, much bigger than that of the impact what we had in 1930s and 2007 global recessions and also um, this may be uh, much bigger than that of uh, two world wars and here and there we have seen certain uh, civil wars uh, unrest and uh, the issues with the borders uh, but i am pretty sure the covid uh, impact is largely unknown there are certain rough estimations but i am pretty sure that those estimations are not accurate and we don't know when are we going to end up uh, the covid impact on our business on our industries and also on our day to day life and we are living in a world which is uh, highly globalized and we are connected and we have our own limitation as well now we talked about zoom we talked about uh, digital transformation all that but of course to which extent can we afford to be checked in we can use but still the people are happy to come to uh, the counter at the bank but still people are happy to go to um, uh, you, you know the outlets where people sell vegetables fish and meat and all that therefore these restrictions uh, also makes uh, lots of uh, issues years to come as we are living in a kind of a uh, Uh, market uh, setting the every single moment is matter uh, if this continues we will be able to have a limited operations and the government alone may not be able to support it 
and the private sector the corporate sector the ngo the international organization should come forward now if you take uh, sri lanka for example this is such a tiny economy and we have about uh, 20 million population and uh, at least 5 to 6 percent out of these are living abroad now you see there are illegal uh, occupants in kuwait itself is about 19000 and it could be about 4 to 5 million sri lankans are living in abroad if they started coming over you can't say no to it they have a they have a right to come back to their motherland so you have to estimate the impact taking all these into account now for the first time in the world history this is not a question about demand the, when we had these two global recessions damita we were trying to stimulate uh, the people's purchasing power that is where the keynesian intervention worked but this is the first time in the history we are facing serious issue in the supply side we have to revisit for 1970s we have to revisit 1960s we have to revisit 1960s where people started thinking of how to enhance the uh, supply how to enhance the supply chain how to keep a supply chain going on now say for example our garment factories are open people are ready to come for work but where the materials come from right therefore when we talked about we should not forget that the impact can be much bigger impact may not be accurately measured therefore we must make sure to have a open mind now banks are ready to assist for 3 months who knows there can be a second wave there can be third wave in my opinion this is a, a v shaped recession we will recover soon but subject to other variables how well we will be able to handle a locally regionally and globally now india is affected badly <clears throat> in our own region and we can't keep the india away india is one of our biggest trading partner almost 45% imports are coming from india all essentials are coming from india if the indian workforce is affected i mean sri lanka will affect it definitely <clears throat> right professor and uh, the second part of your question the support you see the presidential task force is appointed to assist at the policy level right the presidential task force is not at the implementation right implementation is the hands of a banks a financial institution the public sector the bureaucrats ngos international organization all that let me take a simple example is our bank is really ready to assist now it is more almost 76 days right i am pleased damita you have been doing a wonderful job but my personal experience still our banks are in collateral banking they will ask a great one i mean my personal opinion my personal experience they will ask a great one collateral they don't look at the balance sheet they don't look at the impact they will ask very simple i can share my own experience even in writing right the our banks are still running collateral banking number 2 our financial institutions are having lots of issues with high cost capital overheads a branding and too many institutions they are competing each other the how many finance companies are in the market advertising themselves by spending huge amount of money 
and still to a large extent informal money market is active in sri lanka it will be active more right where we need to look at new set of institution to assist and to recover and to sustain the economy going in sri lanka okay thank you uh, thank you very much professor i like to invite uh, sorry uh, encourage uh, webinar participants to send type in their questions as we go to the second next round of questions i see a few questions already so i like to encourage more questions to all our panelists <clears throat> uh, professor just a follow up uh, is there is this misconception that because they managed the uh, the health aspect commendably so far at least uh, there is no community level uh, spread that the actual impact on sri lanka may, may not be as worse as people portray uh, do you only try you see now um, the peep the fear factor of the people fear factor of the community is still to a large extent if you go to any institution uh, it is not fully functioning and the overheads are uh, uh, remain same you know and uh, how long uh, can we go on right it is pathetic and and and, and yeah. also uh, you know people expect too much from the government right none are ready to sacrifice a bit now if you take the recent incidents of uh, this uh, shortage of rice in the market we have gone to that text i am ready to go to jail <laughs> then <laughs> making losses so that's the kind of attitudes that we have are we really ready to uh, take the common uh, responsibility <clears throat> are we re- ready to share the responsibility with the government the sri lanka government can't uh, sustain unless people support now the people who import air condition comes after people who import mobile phone comes after now we have a serious issues of um, foreign reserves and our uh, import dependency could be about 86% right uh, starting from the uh, paro spectacles to shirt the wristwatch to you name it all our imports right even our industries are heavily import dependent right that is the issue and we have to allow people to manufacture people to get involved in economic activities <coughs> and let the government to run the support services let the market to operate and let the market to handle the rest oh, thank you thanks uh, professor uh, excellent uh, contributions from all <clears throat> uh, i'd like to move on to ravi uh, ravi are you there hi nishtha yes hi hi <clears throat> based on the uh, insight shared so far uh, where do you think uh, the gaps are um uh, in terms of uh, the next few uh, you know we we've gone through about 3 months now where do you think we need to catch up and uh, fix as we move along so as uh, as uh, dimanta and uh, professor uh, mentioned now even this uh, moratorium that had been given uh, by the government of this 50 billion um, there have been deadlines set and uh, it has been sub, uh, it has been divided to the banks for them to um, get the get the correspondence from the general public to support so uh, there have been some delays i mean based on whatever the public says but then um, um, i think uh, uh, the delay is between uh, the the customers anticipation is up front where the customers are requesting the money customers in the sense i meant as the corporates and the smes who are impacted by this covid uh, pandemic so they they would wanted the money uh, as soon as possible in order to ensure or shape up their working capital problems that they encounter uh, so um, i suppose there is a gap in between the expectation of what the corporate sector is expecting as well as um, the, the the time uh, duration given by the banks and the central bank to to rectify and to central bank to uh, further analyze and provide the final um, um, solution in terms of this grant so uh, that is what i feel mr so there is a expectation gap in terms of the corporate sector as well as bank okay fine <clears throat> dimanta i'd like to bring you back uh, can you explain uh, how is the status uh, progress in terms of debt moratorium how much uh, demand has 
Devin, I mean, what what kind of percentage? I think uh, Ranjan spoke about a 12 trillion asset base. You mentioned about a 10 million, a 10 trillion asset base. How much of debt in suspense uh, servicing are we talking about? Uh, the industry numbers, the total loan book as we discussed earlier is about 9 to 10 trillion if you take the finance companies as well. Uh, but we don't have the industry exact number because they still as a time frame given for customers to apply for the moratorium. However, based on initial indications that we have received, I would estimate this estimation uh, maybe around uh, now in the case of SMEs and the retail portfolio, close to 60 70 customers, uh, percentage of the customers have applied, and this is the feedback that we get from the other banks as well. And in terms of corporates, maybe around 40 percent. So, I would estimate somewhere around 50 to 60 percent of the portfolio would ask for the moratorium, uh, and some may not eligible for the moratorium because there are certain industries who are eligible for moratorium like the tourism, the garment exporters and all. Uh, But some may not fall into that moratorium but naturally banks in any situation like a distress situation we have to support these customers and consider that. So they may not qualify for the entire six months moratorium but some may have to get a longer duration and in some cases it may be more than six months. For example, we need to also bear in mind is the, that we are talking about COVID only now. Last year, April with the East attack, we had to give a moratorium to the entire tourism sector and some of the other sectors of the economy. And after the economy was reviving back, then at the beginning of the year, we were also, banking sector was giving a similar moratorium and debt relief to the SME driven businesses in January, February, that is what we are working on. There was a direction as well. And then on top of that, this COVID related moratorium. So in the case of some other customers, the moratorium, for for example, the tourism related entity, a hotel, they would enjoy this moratorium from last April up to this April, but now that is extended till December this year. So you are talking about more than 18 months. But even the way that the, you know, for the in the world to get back to the norm that was, or even for us to get the tourism back to that level, maybe another one year's time till a vaccine is found. I mean, people freely travel and all. There'll be a quite a big gap. So we may have to live with this moratorium based on different different industries. But uh, for the six months moratorium, I would estimate about fifty to sixty percent of the portfolio would get under this moratorium, and then uh, but the banks are allowed to accrue interest but the moratorium during the moratorium the capital and interest payments are deferred for six months and thereafter customers to pay that later on so it is not a uh, not stopping uh, basically the payment but it's a deferral of this payment so that is how in terms of accrual accounting banks are so accounting yeah uh, was there any finality on the how do you pay the accrued interest uh, was there any directive so far uh, so there are still some discussions going on, uh, I think both the, with the banking sector and also with the non-bank financial sector with the regulator. I think so far our understanding is that uh, uh, banks can accrue interest. However, uh, when it comes to the, uh, the I think the, now the discussion is on the equated monthly installment debt. Uh, now there again the banking sector, uh, I think we shared the numbers somewhere around 1.5 trillion exposure under equated monthly installments. Uh, uh, that is where the question is uh, at what rate to be applied during this six months moratorium given uh, and some agreement have been reached so most likely uh, by next week we should be able to get some clarity about what is the rate that we should apply. Uh, so that's the discussion going on but however the other exposure or I think we have already agreed the six months moratorium, no interest would be charged at that time. But thereafter, if a customer is uh, going for an extended period to pay this, then the banks are allowed to uh, charge a reasonable interest, but not at the uh, not higher than the originally contracted rate. There had been some understanding that has been reached. 
Okay. Thank Otherwise, you. if you if you have no interest, then there's a huge impact that we have quantified to the regulator because of quite a significant impact on the interest uh, itself. Uh, so I think the regulator also have realized it, and now the discussion is now on the uh, EMIs or the equated monthly installment exposures. Yeah. So as of now, for the next six months, there won't be any interest payment coming to the banks. Cash flow wise, yes, no. Uh, so, but however, there'll be accrual. But okay, yeah. cash, I mean, about 40, 50 percent of the portfolio, you won't get that okay. cash flow. Okay. Not only interest, the capital as well. Absolutely, Ranjani, uh, just like to move on to you. How how are the banks financially faced in terms of you know taking such a hit? Uh, one is that, and whether they've been talking about uh, whether banks can take a haircut. Uh, you think they can uh, uh, sort of much be more more responsive uh, given the impact? Um, so, Nista, although I'm not a banker, I work closely with the banks. So yeah. while appreciating uh, professor's views, uh, I would also like to make a statement that banks, unlike any other institutions, the financial institutions, the funding part comes from the depositors significantly. So they do have a responsibility in uh, uh, dispersing the loans to ensure that the money comes back because end of the day, they are responsible for the de uh, depositors as well, who are also people who are affected by the COVID implications. Um, having said that, uh, yes, as Dimante explained, uh, the processing has taken more time, uh, mainly because the staff were not available. Uh, there are op operational matters, limited staff who are focusing on processing the loans. And at this point, uh, all the banks are actually overriding some of their normal processes to fast track this uh, loan disbursement. Now, having said that, uh, uh, again, going back to Professor's comment on the collateral lending, uh, it actually has two aspects. One, yes, we need to move away from collateral lending. That is what the new financial reporting also encourages. But having said that, the borrowers also need to come up with more reliable and re realistic cash flows because that's one of the fundamentals uh, if you are moving away from collateral. In the current situation, uh, the borrowers also have responsibility because this moratorium is not going to continue or it may continue but at this point they also need to have a recovery plan by end of that moratorium period so to that extent the cash flow projections need to come up of course there are so many uncertainties may not be immediately available but that may be a way forward so it's, it's a balanced uh, responsibility from both sides um, from the financial reporting perspective, the institute has recognized the need to relax certain rules uh, until the banks settle down. So the first quarter, we have actually issued uh, practical experience. Uh, that's one of the reasons you wouldn't see a big impact uh, in the first quarter, may not be in the second quarter as well, um, as far as the loan impairments are concerned. Another factor to be considered, the banks do have uh, investments in equity shares. So when the stock market is affected, the banks are taking the hit straight to the PNL. Most of them are taking it straight to the PNL. So that also is an additional uh, impact on the PNL of the banks. Okay, fine. Thank you. I'd like to uh, take some questions from the uh, from the audience. Thank you very much for being patient. Uh, <clears throat> a few questions. Um, maybe I think one has been flagged off. Okay, by the month maybe this is uh, I think something will be discussed. An SME customer delaying again delay, uh, and the branch putting the blame on the head office and the central bank. Uh, plus, there he also put uh, collateral. I'm sure this is just one comment. Yeah, can be uh, I mean see now when as we earlier discussed this the other. Uh, amount is 50 billion. When you look at the total 10 trillion exposure, 50 billion is quite minute. And yeah, banks are also faced with the challenge of how to please all our customers when such a big number of customers have applied for uh, this focus and loan. You need to also ensure that there's equitable distribution. So now I did mention that I think in our case we look at their cash flow, the existing customer. Naturally, you have to give priority to your existing customer, and we take the comfort of the existing operations and give that facility. But maybe the different institutions also their credit standards may be different. Now in our case, we centralize all the credit approvals. So even a branch banking customer, 
we are the ISA, we actually we increase the number of staff to process this we put a lot of resources to ensure that these are smoothly processed there may be certain bottle, bottlenecks in when it comes to different different banks so i'm unable to comment about it other reason sometime may ask him for the collateral can be now one is you have to carry the credit risk you need to safeguard the depositors on the other side but maybe as an excuse as well because when you are unable to please all the customers sometimes you may ask okay you need to have this security otherwise you can't come i mean that can be a practical answer sometimes a branch banker might be given to some of these customers so i don't know i mean this is also can be a possibility okay a uh, lot of questions to you dimanta uh, one is you know when you accrue the interest it's uh, for couple of months can what about the capacity to pay that as well because uh, there is no real business taking place moratorium is 8 to 18 to 12 months accrued interest will be substantial will these companies be able to pay uh, so the, uh, sorry i don't have the question uh, what, what no, can... uh, when moratorium is uh, during the moratorium uh, 18 to 12 months of accrued interest will be substantial when you you know Stammer. so how yeah and we we'll, what about the capacity of these customers to pay as well in 6 months or 9 months or 12 months time so naturally so that's why so if the customer is unable to pay within 6 months then we need to structure it at a longer term uh, nista and we need to look at how fast this customer can come back to some near normal operations so 6 months is what the regulator has specified however i mean any customer if he goes to any distress situation any banker would do that we, we i think we we restructure them and try to help them so it is not limited to 6 months it can be more than 6 months however if it is limited to 6 months this interest uh, the, the 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 interest rate that was still been discussed would be applied but however if it is a longer duration naturally banks also have to cover their cost of funds by by giving this extended period but the customer is give, will be given a longer period than 6 months uh, mr so it's depend on each customer's ability to pay okay okay and i think there may be a little bit of a continuation on that question actually uh, right. he also asks are you analyzing and deciding on some entities who may not recover from the shock i think he means in terms of are you taking that call in prior, prior to granting the uh, concessions and the loans are you taking that call by doing sort of an an, 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 an analysis of that sorry okay um, prior to making so, i i yeah so that is part of the credit evaluation see ultimately as i mentioned those central bank is refinancing ultimately banks are answerable for the funding that is basically our basic funding is depositors money so our moral obligation is to safeguard depositors funds and then cover that and then support the through the lending activities so here when we evaluate if we see a particular business there's no future unfortunately there are we we, we are aware certain industries may not have a future given the this development at least for possible future maybe couple of years so then we also have to ensure that that when you deploy our funds probably there may be better customers who may need this and who can re, uh, revive back and we need to assist them so when especially when you have a limited funding source which is 50 billion when you allocate we need to allocate also to those who can revive back if you know that may there may be there's no such situation i think we need to give priority to the customer who can actually use this funds keep their employees in their payroll and then rise up again when situation improves i think so we need to deploy so that is our responsibility as when you deploy so there can be some customers who may not get that because unfortunately the industry or the operation they are in may not continue so there can be situations like that right so there are a couple of more questions for dimanta uh, nista if you don't mind shall i go ahead and go right. get into them because i think dimanta needs to drop off uh, yeah, a I little think. bit earlier than we have planned Uh, so continuing on from that original question we had at the start where an sme uh, had uh, let me just uh, 
get to that yeah uh, so he says i am an sme and i'm worried about the delay about the cash flow easing loan of 4% concerned about the process carried by my bank uh the branch puts the blame on the head office and the central bank i have also kept a collateral uh he has gone on to subsequently he has uh, further said in spite of cash and bank personal collateral working capital loan is getting delayed i have been 43 years with the bank um i think uh, that's a very very uh, personal and genuine question so maybe you can uh, shed some light on that to help yeah so i think the answer is i think i, I answered that the first part of that question uh so i don't know about the credibility of this particular customer and then i don't know which bank has uh, be, that he's been banking for 43 years uh but each case is uh, different uh but i i think i answered the earlier part because then when you deploy that limited allocated out of 50 billion some banks are allocated a small amount so they have to basically choose the customers so there can be another situation like that how to how to give this okay and so each bank also has to uh, you know weigh the pros and cons based on their own internal uh, credit and credit risk uh, evaluations yes. have to be done yeah. internally as well uh, uh, okay. so the next uh, mr should i continue or would you like to do is there anything i know bank is ready to ready to uh, uh, sacrifice a bit you see um, Uh, I'm not against the banks. I'm against uh, the, some of the attitudes. Um, you see, we are in a crisis. The bank should come forward, right? Now, some of these questions raised by uh, certain participants, um, I have come across quite a large number of, including myself. Um, you know, those are sincere, genuine. Even I uh, sent a letter to the central bank. Uh, stating that uh, this is how uh, the attitudes you see uh, the, 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 uh, this is real damita uh, uh, this is real i know you are doing a wonderful job at ndb and maybe certain other banks also doing their best but still for all uh, this is a issue to be addressed now uh, uh, this is beyond uh, the the regulator this is beyond uh, the government this is uh, all in the hands of uh, you know, a few individuals uh, you know the customers uh, uh, first get the contact mm. right and unless uh, we um, rectify and uh, that's what i said i am not in a position to predict the outcome and i have a sincere feeling that uh, uh, the recovery depends on uh, the how well uh, we will handle this and i agreed with ranjani the bank have a responsibility uh, for their depositors the banks are not lending just uh, based on uh, the deposits you see the banks also can generate their own funds banks is also in a business so banks should be ready to uh, share the uh, at least a part of a risk uh, damita you have clearly explained you look at the balance sheet if it is a genuine case you are going ahead right but of course when it comes to uh, the small uh, micro and medium scale businesses they don't have balance sheet they don't have uh, uh, but uh, still for all they represent uh, the 40 to 50% of our uh, economy sure. so that is where we need a bit of a open eye uh, to taking care of their interest if gami malu karya Uh, bakery area all that uh, collapse right uh, it will be a huge problem now say for example government need to provide the employment for a state own university graduates the government can't do that i mean government can do to an extent but not the whole responsibility should be in the hands of the government right the people talked about shrinking government then the same time people act to expand the size of the government which is quite unfortunate yeah the so, professor you are very correct i think uh, the the what you mentioned game malukarya and that's a real that is the our heart of our economy and we saw them coming and helping us during this covid period so if you look look at who came and distributed these essentials during this lockdown period are those small time vendors so we need to also support them in a different platform to sell their products as well now again so, sorry to get back to that question of a particular uh, participant 
Now, if that customer was banking with that particular bank for 43 years, naturally that bank would have the records of their performance. So, I don't think it's fair to us uh, collateral for uh, somebody who has been banking with such a long period. So, without more details, I can't come in. But it is a genuine situation where if a customer is good, I think without collateral. Other thing is, if I think there are some limited funds available. So, in that case, a bank can use their own funds to support this customer. If it is a genuine request, not at 4%. Naturally, banks' cost of funds are higher, but certainly not at 4 But bank can use their own funds and come with a reasonable rate and support this customer. So, uh, I mean, these are options available. Uh, but certainly, the SME is the backbone. So, we need to support that. And that's where I think uh, banking sector has also come up uh, with trading platforms, using the digital platforms that we have. So that they also have a platform to sell and then the customer. So are a lot more, I think the COVID also had learned, we had learned a lot and the banks are also thinking pattern has changed and that lot more that we can do with these new learnings. <clears throat> and that, I'm just tempted to make a comment. Yeah. Um, sometimes we actually find some of these small players take their loan burden very seriously and they pay. Uh, but the larger players take it very easy and that's what hit the PNL of banks very often because the impact is very significant. Ah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and then at that when the big boy big 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 customers default uh, banks really don't talk about deposit interest anyway. Uh, but Dimanta, just uh, there's this question about how how much focus there is this question about banks are giving immediately for credit card holders. Uh, there's a question, uh, are the concessions exactly hitting the real, really needed? An example is that all credit card holders offered a concession rate of 15% for the first 50,000 limit and a lesser minimum payment as a blanket. So he's asking whether uh, this relief is really going to the really need, needy as opposed to uh, credit card customers who may not be really their, their consumer, consumer banking. So, uh, this is what the regulator has come up uh, yeah, below 50,000 up to 15% in the uh, normal credit card rate was somewhere around 24 to 28%. So, it's a significant drop in interest rate. And uh, uh, But I think that the average, if you look at the average uh, credit card usage in the country, the average credit limit, Mr. This 50,000 actually reasonably cover a, quite a significant uh, population of credit card holders. So, I think that is going to the needy sector. 50,000 is a reasonable limit uh, and funding at 15% for two months. Uh, I think that covers adequately the needy sector. Okay, right. A uh, few questions. Uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, Professor can answer this. I mean, is there real one question about whether if a person cannot uh, needs refinance uh, but can't afford any loan repayments and this must be I'm just thinking, there was also a reference about the micro financing segment had been overlooked in the government relief. What is the government's response with regard to the microfinance segment? Uh, Professor, you need to unmute. Okay. Yes, sir, that is the most concern in the segment. And uh, I have uh, certain issues that I have raised uh, in many forums. Are we really, really running a kind of a microfinance uh, business in Sri Lanka? The microfinance companies are charging a much more higher rate of interest than that of uh, commercial banks. And uh, they are like uh, front brokers, right? Uh, 2% a month uh, could be about 24%. Sometimes 3% a month uh, could be about 36%. Much cheaper than that of the local money lender. And their financial requirement is very small. I remember uh, we have done a study for the World Bank uh, years back. Um, that time, there are about uh, 400 million rupees being dispersed only in the, uh, the port uh, area. You know, the banning market, all that uh, uh, four cost trees, all right. So, informal dwelling, uh, informal uh, money lenders, right, for a uh, uh, three to four percent per day, right. So, still that segment dominates, 
in this micro and uh, uh, small uh, uh, business sector right now my biggest worry is that there are about 20 million oh, sorry rather 2 million uh, uh, self employed uh, making their living out of uh, running small businesses right pole redivi kunana you know chun pan kare punchi punchi business kare ఫైనాన్షియల్ అరేంజ్మెంట్ what is the right. government thing about it any any do you, you know we have set up dfcc we set up ndb the the purpose has been served i remember when uh, dr nimal sandras was the chairman ndb was uh, uh, state owned uh, we did a evaluation uh, along with the current governor uh, professor w relaxman on the uh, asian development bank funding for small and medium scale industries those two banks were established purposely for development purposes now i don't know that to which extent these banks have their own mandate to to support the development i mean uh, the function as a development bank that is why i always argue even all the banks can get together and set up a small entity to support uh, these unheard uh, uh, group of people who are uh, not a burden to the government they are making their own living let them try now if you look at uh, the china if you look at the japan if you look at the singapore taiwan thailand there are about 60 to 70% of the responsibility of the economy running the economy is in the hands of uh, micro small uh, and medium scale businesses I understand no uh, professor but i was is the gam uh, is since you're close to the government is government doing anything about microfinance segment the, that's what i said okay. government okay. definitely will looking at it but the okay. government alone can't do everything we should okay. not expect too much okay. understand the government intervention is there but when the government intervention is too much now say for example the recent gazette notification uh, imposing certain taxes how the political criticism frames out the simple argument of having the status notification is to encourage the local manufacturing now nista api kossa idala papis padura me foreign market to lingen ni so so right so can't we do that and we are creating a lot of opportunities understood okay uh, uh, sorry nista i need to excuse myself but before that can i very quickly comment to dr uh, sorry professor pandare's comment uh, now the low value credits and all yes i think the stools the development banks were initially set up but later on what happened was with the country getting upgraded to the middle income status this long term funding died out so these uh, development banks naturally to continue they were converted as commercial banks and then they were allowed to take deposits so so that's why the model is changed that both dfcc and ndb are now fully fledged commercial banks but we do have that project finance and the uh, sme finance origins and that's where our credit teams are structured in a way to assess these even without proper cash flows so that that history is still there so we 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 can do that and what at ndb what we are doing is we have a quite a large number of micro customers working with us we do have a bank to you where with a tap about 100 of our branches go to these customers and get allow, allow them to save with us and you won't believe we have more than 2000 customers try show drivers every day they are saving around 1000 rupees or the vegetable vendors or the dambulla market there are so many customers are dealing with them and then we have the data and they can also get credit low value credit actually so that is one thing that we are working on other one is on the uh, qr code based uh, payments when the lanka qr is ready with that and some banks are ready with the interoperability we can give credit to uh, these uh, micro smes 
and support them and also the payment gateway can be improved uh, compared to what we are another reason thing that we did was with the uh, uh, ndb did sign up with daras lk which is a alibaba uh, subsidiary which has the largest platform to sell using their platform and they have the largest distribution network as well so that way you link the suppliers from the villages to the market in even colombo other country, other cities so without any intermediary so and that is given to our women driven enterprises for exclusive 6 months period as well so like that a lot more use in the digital platform that some banks are working on uh, process okay. so just to highlight some of those things i and need to we know that you are doing a wonderful job thank you thank you yeah thank you sir Uh, Devanta, before you rush off, if I can just uh, there are a few questions that are specifically for you. So what I will do is I will email them across to you, right. and if you could just take a few minutes, then we can share it with our panelists. So uh, so viewers uh, don't fret. Uh, the questions that you have specifically asked of Devanta, we will forward to him yes. and try to get a response for you because he does need to uh, uh, log yeah. out for another meeting now. Thank, Thank you, Devanta, for your time. Uh, we really appreciate the insights and the time that you've shared with us here today. Okay. okay. Thank you very much Good for the luck. panel. Good well, luck. Thank you. Uh, we have about ten more minutes to wrap it up. I'd like to post this question to. I don't know whether Ranjani can respond to this. Uh, there is a question: When will the central bank allow transfer of funds for expat earnings in Sri Lanka? Is CTRA fund transfer allowed now? No. Are you aware? No, I'm not very aware. Well. Ravi, are you? No, Nishtar. Maybe Dimanta would have been the best person to answer that question. Okay, right. Okay. That one also we will in that case forward it through to Dimanta or even one of our other panel. I mean, we'll we'll get the response to you. Uh, I think that's uh, Mr. Radha Krishnan who's asked that. We'll get the response across to you by email uh, shortly. Good. Okay. <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, there's a question. I think maybe Professor can answer or even um, the. Uh, it's about if we club those two questions together nista uh, the the one on uh, so it says local production professor local production or local costs in comparison to the region are not competitive uh, sustainability once import restrictions are eased is not really tenable shouldn't the government take a long term view to truly encourage uh, local manufacturing i think that's something that you were talking about as well um so do you want to add anything to that uh, professor you know the the, the biggest anti arguments of uh, developing the local economy is that the size of the market now as because of the market is smaller people are not really happy to encourage uh, local businesses right that is a myth you see you don't have to encourage uh, 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 people to have the similar means because the, the, the we are in a global market now if you take uh, the smaller countries the size of the population may be about 4 million but they are the biggest manufacturers in the motor cars in the world now if you take japan for example they don't have any materials but they are one of the largest uh in the automobile industry and if you take swiss for example they are dominating the entire uh, research businesses in the world right the sri lanka lost the opportunity i mean the covid is a opportunity is given to sri lanka to see the next level therefore at least i don't argue that we can be uh, self sufficient at least to reach uh, the self reliance Uh, which means that to rely on to a large extent uh, by our own that is where we have to develop a kind of a consciousness uh, among industrialists uh, those who are involved in commerce uh, trading uh, uh, particularly those who are making their living out of uh, imports right and uh, uh, if that kind of attitude continues Right. Let me share one story. Just after the Second World War, that is how Japanese were uh, thinking about the Japanese economy. They were requested to wake up from the ash. 
Hiroshima and Nagasaki make the entire Japan a bowl of ash. And within 10 to 15 years, Japanese took the turn. Why can't we? Sri Lanka certainly can promote alternative tourism now. The one of the biggest issues in Europe and certain other developed countries is taking care of the uh, elderly people. The Sri Lanka can open market for taking care of the elderly people. We have enough people to take care of and we are very good at hospitality. You see, likewise, we need a people who could think out of the box. We need people think beyond the theory. Good. Uh, interesting. Uh, can I ask, maybe the last last set for Ranjani? You spoke about various risks for the industry, banking sector. Uh, you mentioned about cyber security risk and all that. Um, you, you know, given the given the uh, chaotic situation post COVID, um, the focus on compliance and all that. Uh, what would be your advice for banks to in terms of in terms of prioritizing? You were to say one, two, three in the next six to twelve months. So I would actually uh, look at from maybe um, six areas, Mr. Um, first one, of course, the employees. They definitely have responsibility towards their employees, their safety, and how they are going to accommodate the working from home arrangement for most of them during this period. The second one, definitely the focus on the customer, how they can actually make some of their services more customer friendly um, and then make that process much easier. Uh, not, I'm not talking only about people who may not have access to digital banking, but there are people who also are more comfortable with digital banking. So to convert the branches more into value adding services and the routine transactions to be routed through this so that people can be the customers who are not really aligned with digital banking can be looked after. Uh, the third one I would say that's where the risk comes, the relation, supply relationships and third parties because the banks deal with a lot of service uh, providers and third parties. So they need to definitely focus on the risk they are exposed to and whether their suppliers as well as their uh, third parties who are working with them are also maintaining same level of uh, risk control. So that's definitely another area. Uh, fourth area, obviously, uh, definitely liquidity, which the banks are currently focusing on. I would also say uh, communication and transparency of banks is fundamental. Uh, in the current uh, in, uh, situation where the practical experience are given, so certain impairments are not booked, certain loans are not ma uh, marked or shifted. Now that actually sometimes give artificial uh, profit numbers where the readers may not really understand the impact of this NPS, which we think will definitely change in the second, third quarter. Um, so I think that level of communication to make that available to the investors and readers exactly where the banks are feeling the pressure. Um, and I think that level of transparency and keeping the stakeholders updated with the different challenges they are facing is important. And the last one, which we find the risk division of all the financial institutions are now taking a very vital role uh, in analyzing the scenario testing. Uh, I think Dimanta, I can't remember, one of the panelists mentioned about monitoring the recoveries of different sectors uh, and uh, looking at it in an early stage, which is quite critical. So that sort of scenario planning also needs to come. So I would actually think those are the six key areas uh, which the bank boards as well as the audit committees along with the management need to start looking at it because this may be the time where the banks are also very vulnerable to fraud risk. So, so thank you. Uh, Ravi, can I draw you in? Uh, I, I, if, you, if you allow me, I'd like to ask an insurance question. <clears throat> uh, how is it? Uh, just a quick answer, I know it's not, uh, I'm taking the broader financial services industry. Yeah. Uh, how is the insurance industry uh, responding and faring 
uh, both in terms of supporting recovery and also surviving because of the premium pay- premium payments and all concerned so as you correctly mentioned uh, nishta uh, i mean um, the regulator especially non life insurance have been um, given exemptions for about uh, from the policies to go up to 90 days credit uh, rather than sticking to the normal 60 or days credit so there have been uh, some ease for the customers uh, especially due to this uh, situation so uh, which is actually helping the customers to uh, pay the money to, to sort out their money i mean this is especially involving with the middle like the, the daily income earners for who's got affected from the uh the sectors are mom probably from the covid uh, impact uh, so the the companies such as tour travel companies the apparel sector the real estate com- companies who's have been impacted by this have been actually given some exemptions uh, for about 90 odd days for them to pay the money um, um, after after that so the regulator has given us uh, exemptions in in terms of these in premium collections uh, nista so uh, that is actually mm-hmm. helping the customers to pay it majorly um, um, on it at the same time uh, um, the insurers also actually coming into some kind of a liquidity problem as as everyone so we don't have the income to pay out our claims as well as on our commissions and other expenditures so Uh, it, it's kind of a balancing balancing both side um, at at um, at a correct equilibrium i would say uh, we start uh, well uh, getting the premium collections on time uh, we would anticipate to pay the outgoes also so insurance companies um, well uh, my personal view is insurance companies might have been a little bit uh, on the upper edge uh, um uh, then uh, what the banks have been uh, doing um, especially most of the companies uh, being uh, eligible i mean especially the company that i work in if you draw an example for the company that i work in for is uh, fully equipped for work from home uh, um, uh, work from home and um, i mean um, uh, even though the government regulation says that minimum 30% uh, of the staff to go to office while the others to work from home so our company is very pledged fully fledged in terms of providing the service to the customers so we are one of the number one or uh, probably one of the best uh, companies that uh, who are who have catered to that kind of an uh, initiatives now work from home and social distancing would be the new normal is that so there's no two words about it so in order for the company to um, enhance that option to redesign to remodify the company's aspect the uh, companies also do need liquidity uh, the cash so the cash definitely the companies would go back to the banks in terms of requesting cash so that's yeah. how i feel uh, nista yeah just want to ask uh, in terms of uh, covering was, was is, has anyone covered this loss as a as a risk uh, uh, well is uh, because well, of uh, Yes uh, so uh, the insurance companies are coming up with innovative products uh, to be honest uh, nista in order to um, to to especially to to handle the cyber risk that it may come with these electronic versions on the e digitalizations as well as the uh, work from home concept and uh, to put uh, the policy conditions are being tailor made to cater to the covid uh, impact or maybe the hospital future hospitalization expenses so the uh, the company design the product development of these insurance companies are actually quite uh, innovative in terms of developing these products uh, so that is what uh, i would think uh, nishtar in terms of insurance companies thank you thank you uh, rai i i think thank you uh, just on that uh, nisha i would like to say although the insurance companies are focusing on innovation coming up with products Uh, I'm not too sure how many companies will be investing and taking on that premium cost. I know. Yeah, that's that's uh, yes. Uh, so uh, actually, Professor Bandara also needs to uh, drop off. He has another meeting scheduled for 5:30, and we've gone about six minutes over our scheduled time. Uh, so, Prof, uh, thank you. Thanks for your time. There was one more question, uh, which was a bit long. Uh, long winded which was specifically for you so what i will do is i will email that across because i think it would take a little bit of time for you to get into it uh, there was a bit of an in depth question this type uh, yes uh, yes you remember what i'm talking about so we will share that with you uh, and then uh, get it across to you uh, and uh, share the response rather with the uh, the viewer who had uh, asked that question prof thank you very much if there's any uh, closing sentiments you'd like to share with us before you drop off and then we'll continue with uh, ranjini and hi hi ravi hi nista i am bye <laughs> so i think uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, ranjini as well on behalf of uh, uh, mcm also for uh, and ravi for being very frank uh, in terms of your views and uh, professor ranjit of course as usual fairly thought provoking uh, and i'm sure <laughs> bankers didn't like it very much but i think you spoke uh, what is commonly uh, out- expressed out- outside the industry so thank you very much uh, i will uh, i think we have covered more or less and i owe to rai to wrap it up 
Uh, thank you. Thanks, Nista, and thanks again to each of our panelists. Uh, as we, as Nista mentioned, and I mentioned as well, we have about three questions uh, that three, four, five actually uh, that we were unable to get through in the course of the, in the time uh, that we had available. Uh, but we will share those questions with our panelists, and our panelists will, uh, I'm sure, uh, help us in getting those responses across to you, which we will do. Uh, so thank you once again, thank you to each and every one of our panelists, your insights and your information, your knowledge uh, always uh, is appreciated and always helps us to uh, move forward uh, as we're trying to do together in and through this, uh, this current situation. Uh, working together is what we all need to do and uh, as in fact I think one of the, one of the questions that had, uh, had also mentioned something uh, similar along those lines and that basically all stakeholders in the economy need to understand uh, from government to individuals that we're all in this together and uh, it's a contribution of each and every one of us in terms of what we do, what we don't do, what we cut down on, what we prioritize. It's all part uh, of cushioning uh, the, 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 the impact on the economy and on the, the impact on, uh, you know, our futures, it's, you know, on our futures and on children's futures. It's all uh, at stake right now and it's dependent on us. So thank you for the insights. Thank you to every single one of our uh, viewers who joined us both here uh, on the live webinar as well as on our uh, Facebook live page. Uh, as always, the video will be up in a couple of days uh, on our YouTube channel. We encourage you to take a look um, and also to maybe update yourself on the entire series of topics that we've been talking about over the past uh, six weeks. Uh, they've been interesting, they've been uh, thought provoking um, and I think um, very, uh, very uh, useful uh, in building uh, throughout your uh, uh, business continuity and uh, what is going on in the future. Uh, so until we see you again next week, uh, keep an eye on the bulletin board and we'll let you know what's happening next week. We actually have a very interesting topic planned for next week. Um, it's one that uh, I haven't seen covered anywhere, so I'm quite excited about it. So I don't want to spill the beans right now, but you'll get an email from us on Monday or Tuesday with the details. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on that session, which is going to be extremely interesting, uh, extremely thought provoking um, and uh, a very, uh, very broad look uh, at a lot of things, a lot of verticals that uh, you'll be surprised um, that we need to look at actually. So uh, thank you once again. Have uh, a brilliant evening and uh, a blessed uh, weekend coming forward uh, from us at Amcham as well as from our panelists. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, stay home as much as you can. Thanks and bye-bye. Thanks.